Well, good morning. I'm Jane Gay. I work at the Iowa Program for Assistive Technology for the Centers of Disabilities and Development at the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. And today, in conjunction with Iowa City Hospice, we're going to talk about helping devices to save time. Now, research has shown that caregivers need strategies for these activities. And I would strongly believe those as a visiting nurse for 11 years as a caregiver, myself as an in-home caregiver and a remote caregiver. Um, these are the activities that strategies need to um, be presented to help caregivers. So bathing, toileting, feeding, dressing, mobility, and then your own individual specific needs might be a little bit different. But these are the main ones that use a lot of time, a lot of energy, create a lot of stress. And so while assistive technology isn't gonna create a big magical cure, to make these all go away, I think that assistive technology will help shrink them down possibly, fit them in a little box that can make them um, a little bit easier to do, quicker to do. So what is assistive technology? Well, assistive technology, or AT, um, is a term of art that means a lot of different things. Basically, if you just think about helping devices, they're pieces of equipment, they're devices, um, that are easily, easily obtained. You might know durable medical equipment, those types of terms. Um, but it's a range of devices that can help you do things. Think of it as a possible solution that's going to help you in your caregiving. And it ranges from low tech to high tech. So it can be as simple as something that raises up a couch so it's easier to get up and down from. Clear to robots. Um, this is a Simo from the Honda company if you want to look up some fun videos to watch, but he is a functional robot that is being used in um, Japan quite a bit for caregiving and variations of him, so robots, and he can pour, he can set up beds, he can do all kinds of things. And I want to emphasize that not everything has to cost as much as a Simo and a robot. It can be very low-tech items and they can be either purchased or built. So. Um, the man is actually sitting on a couch with store-built risers, um, and they are available locally at many um, lumber-type stores, Menards, Lowe's, things like that. Or they can be homemade. If you know somebody, um, many Iowans may not have a lot of money, but they have a lot of people that have tools and know how to do things. So they can be um, homemade or built. So let's see some devices that we're talking about today that might save you some. And I'm going to vary from that list, first of all, because I think these are important ones. And first, that's alerting devices that many care providers um, told me or myself is that, well, I have to hear. I have to hear whether they're getting up at night or they need help or they need assistance. And so they stay close. They might need to stay in the room. They might need to feel they stay in the house or a certain part of the house when they need to get further away, which means they can't do what you need to do around the home. Um, and you can't do what needs to get done. And it also means that you may not have time for yourself because you're always on alert, you're always on call, or you can't sleep well. A very common issue or problem, well, I can't sleep well or I can't sleep enough, just plain time-wise, because always on alert, always having to hear if something's happening. And this can cause anxiety or fear of the caregiver or for the person themselves um, that, am I gonna be heard? So very low-tech devices, which we all may know about and laugh about, or some type of bell system and being called from, and sometimes we get very aggravated at those bells. Um, you know, let's be honest here. Um, let's do something other than that little tingle bell. <laughs> um, and a simple solution could be just a remote doorbell. And most of these devices are very easy, again, available locally. And so this is a remote doorbell that um, the person can push Instead of putting it up by the front door, it's going to be near their bed or their chair. It doesn't have to be attached. It runs by battery and a Wi-Fi system, so it doesn't have to be plugged in. And they can push the button. And the caregiver then would carry the other part, the um, part that has the blue on it, and they can put it in their pocket. They can put it near the table. They can carry it around, and you can get further away. You know you're going to hear it. Um, and it allows you to go into other parts of the house, down to the basement to do the laundry, um, out to the yard to do some things without that constantly having to rush back and forth, which is a time waster. Okay, um, another one is an intercom system. 
And again, it doesn't have to be a built-in wall system. It can be a system that, again, there's two parts of it, one that is with the caregiver and one that is with the um, person who's being cared for. And they can call and they can talk. And this helps in that it's not just a signal, a bell or alarm or the doorbell, is that they can actually tell you what you want. It's a time and energy saver. So assistive technology, again, these are examples of ways that are going to gain time, save time, by allowing the person to either be more independent, decrease the number of chores being done. So in this case, if they're telling you what you need, you might not have to walk all the way to the bedroom to find out, oh, they need water or a glass of water, and then you have to walk back to the bathroom. So it's going to save energy, it's going to save time, and a pretty reasonable cost. Another alerting device is that you may feel, oh, I need to know if they're getting up for their chair, or they're getting up from the bed, and therefore you need to stay very close or rely on the person to ask for help, and we all know that that may or may not happen, and you worry about it. So a chair alarm or a bed alarm, they both work in the same way. Um, again, relatively um, reasonably priced for the decrease in stress, better sleep, um, being able to get some things done without worrying about that. That if the weight is lifted off the pad, you are signaled that the person is getting up. And this is just one example of many different types of systems that send off an alarm if a door is opened. It could be the bedroom door, it could be an outside door that you need to know about. And there are several different types of systems like this. This is just a, a relatively um, easy to find one. Um, actually, it's for hotel rooms. And that's the one thing about assistive technology that is interesting to me anyway, is that many solutions of AT are actually used for something else. In this case, this is something you could hang on a hotel door to know that somebody's breaking into your hotel room. Well, it's, a door is opening. In this case, um, you want that your home door or the bedroom door, something like that. Um, there are also other systems that are geared toward persons um, of all ages that um, have elopement issues that would signal or um, confuse the person so they wouldn't know it was a door. And that's kind of a whole show unto itself. So just that there are alerting devices or devices that can help um, a door not to be open. And we can give more information on that. Or you're just plain afraid the person's going to fall and you need to be alert. So there are alerting systems that um, will go off if someone falls. Very low tech devices, just something that can be worn on the person. Um, there are much higher level systems that actually monitor the person's movement around the house. And this might be for more the remote caregiver, um, the person who's concerned about a parent or a sibling or something that lives in a different town, a different part of town. And it would alert um, that, or monitor the person that they're getting up or that they haven't gotten up for a while at their usual 8 o'clock and somebody better check on them, or that they have fallen, they're staying in the bathroom kind of not quite in the same place that the toilet is or the bathroom is, and that would alert that something wrong is going on. So fall alerts. Now, in the same line as alerting and communicating um, with a, a system, allowing the person more independence frees the caregiver up to do different things. So an environmental control, and this is a larger device, but environmental controls are remote systems that allow you to control anything that plugs in. Now, most people have a TV remote, all right? Same type of deal. You give them a TV remote, you don't have to keep changing the channel, or you yourself don't have to keep getting up, correct? Now, think of that in an expanded way, up to several devices, or even up to 400 devices, more expensively, that a person can control their environment and not ask the caregiver to do something anything that can be plugged in. And it looks similar to a TV remote. And some of them can actually even be controlled by a voice. So instead of pushing a button or one of many buttons, they can say, and they usually name the computer. So let's say, Mabel, Mabel, turn on the lights. So you don't have to keep going back in and out as a caregiver, turning the TV off and on, the radio. And as the picture would show, just listing out above, they can control lights, TV, radio. They can help the bed go up and down, thermostat, cooler or hotter, phones, computers, windows. If you have an electronic windows, um, they can open them or close them. Or electronic systems of 
curtains and shades. Now this may be much more than many of you are interested in or can afford, but just to show you that they can control a lot of different things, even if it's only five or six things. Having a fan go off and on, the TV, the phone, a much less expensive system. When I first started working in this area several decades ago, a system like I'm showing on the screen right now that controlled up to 400 devices cost about $10,000. It was the size of a three-ring notebook, and I can say three-ring notebook because you all are going to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Let's say much, much, much bigger than a cell phone, okay? You know, ten times bigger than an iPad, okay? But about the size of a three-ring notebook, okay? And it could control three to, three to 4,000 devices in a home. That same system now costs under $1,000 because of smart homes that are doing these types of things. So this is not built into the home, a smart home, but it is an adaption that is brought in and does those same types of things. Now, communication. After being alerted and knowing what the person needs or that they need help or assistance, the next thing is communication. And many family members used to tell, tell me, I don't know what they want. I, I, you know, we try and I ask questions and you, you have to become a mind reader sometimes, especially when they lose their means of communication. And this creates helplessness on both sides of the relationship, stress, frustration, what are they trying to tell me? And you can imagine the reverse of that is, I'm trying to tell you I need this and you don't understand. Even anger and takes a lot of time and a lot of energy. So communication systems can be as simple as a piece of paper or cardboard that have yes and no on it that the person could point to if they're still able to point or look at one way or the other, holding it up and are they looking toward the yes side or are they looking toward the no side. The story goes that when Woody Guthrie was at the end of the life and had lost his ability to communicate, he actually had two big pieces of cardboard and everybody asked him just yes or no questions and he could flail up Either is yes or is no answer. And you know that was way back in the late 1950s. We didn't have electronic devices. It could be a, a more, more than just yes and no with the ability to point what are the main things that they need to communicate at later in the process. <coughs> so bathroom, water, I need my medicines pictures of people. I want to see my daughter or my grandchildren or something like this. Could be a very important communication system. More than just yes and no, and you can get really good at asking yes or no questions. Um, a few pictures or more pictures. And of course there's many more complicated systems depending on their needs and their abilities. But it can be as simple as a piece of paper with pictures on it. It can be using a cell phone for a communication system with pictures that people can get pretty good at going through quickly, or typing out a message in the lower uh, left-hand corner where they're typing out a message if their ability or poking, and the machine talks to them, or it's digit talks for them, or has a digital readout of what they're trying to tell you. Or an electronic system, again, of main pictures that if they push the button, it says out loud, um, again, uh, the pictures of, I need a drink, if they push the picture that has water. And it says it out loud. But of course, the reality is, all they need to do to communicate that is just point to a picture of a glass of water. It doesn't necessarily have to say it out loud for them. Or um, up above is a little uh, paper notebook that's spiral brown that has a lot of messages that could be, could be um, put into there. All right, back to the list that um, research has shown that caregivers need assistance with bathing. It can take a lot of time, it can take a lot of energy. So keeping the person independent as long as possible means that that is one less chore that needs help with, as long as the person, of course, is safe. An example of this is a bath bench that straddles the tub. The picture shows that pretty well. So the person can sit on the bench very safely put their legs while they're seated into the tub, so there's no worrying about getting that big step across the, the tub. And then um, using a handheld shower, again, relatively easy to install and very easily available. Both of these are, are 
widely available locally, and I was rather shocked when I was working on this presentation to find Bed Bath & Beyond actually sells bath benches and many other assistive technology things, of course. So then I spent a lot of time wasting seeing what they had <laughs> available. Um, if not in the store, they have it online. Always like to see solutions coming up readily available. These aren't specialty items anymore that you have to hunt for. They're available in local stores. They're available online very easily. Um, and then having a handheld shower that is lower and the bench can be more forward so they don't even have to hold that. It just sprays lower on them. And that's an important part to remember. You actually can lower that shower head down so it's not overwhelming them on their head. So if they're independent then, that's one less chore. Or it does save energy and time once more assistance is needed to have a system like this. So um, it's not taking us long even balancing. And again, these are nips and tucks. These aren't magical big solutions that now you have a whole hour free. But it is energy and time saving if you're assisting somebody to have a system like this also. Here's a variation of the chair where the person again would sit down outside the tub and then there's a gliding. So it is actually built for that chair component to glide over versus the person moving over themselves a little bit. Again, saves a little bit of time and energy for the person assisting or for the person might be able to again do it by themselves now without assistance. There are also walk-in or roll-in showers. So changing a bathtub in with an insert to make this happen is possible. Again, local stores have these inserts or you can tear them all out and have a lovely tile system like on the left. Um, understanding the difference is very important though. A walk-in shower means you can walk in. There is a lip that has to be negotiated. And if you're not able to lift your foot, that does become a trip hazard. Um, a lot of people really like this because they are so afraid of the water coming out. But roll-in showers are possible to do. It's a matter, and, and plumbers should be able to do this if they're asking and explain the difference. So a roll-in shower means that a wheelchair or a bath shower chair will be able to be rolled in in the shower given while they sit in that shower chair, or they could transfer over to. But two important things, again, if time and um, the cost of it is possible, it does make life easier. Um, these types of modifications, if you have long-term care insurance, um, many, not all, but many long-term care policies do provide funding for uh, an amount of home modifications. And the bathroom is a very good place to spend that money for safety and time savings. Um, also, when you consider about doing things easier and safer and saving time or maintaining independence, um, a plexi, there are plexiglass plastic um, covers that can go over the water if you are afraid the person is going to change it and burn themselves. So you have to reach in and around and under. You have to think about it a little bit harder or it won't happen by accident, the water becoming too hot and scalding the person. Shower dispensing, again, this is assistive technology that was created for other purposes, other reasons. It makes it easier, simple. It makes it easier and simple for care providers. So the or independent for the person. So while I, you know, I worry about them bending down to get that shampoo bottle or balancing if they're still trying to stand and do all that. Well, just pushing into your hand makes it simple and safer so you don't have to worry about it. They might stay independent for a, a while longer. And you can make or buy mitts that you actually put the soap in, again, so you and or that person aren't worrying about dropping it and managing all of this together. It's just in a mitt, and it goes, if you are a nurse by training, you know how to do a tricky little fold with a washcloth. Or you can ask hospice, and they'll show you how to do that. Again, saving time and energy and doing things quicker and easy, using a terry cloth bathrobe instead of a towel. It is more comfortable, first of all, because it keeps you warmer than standing there all wet while somebody tries to dry you or you dry yourself and you're worried about the person bending over, so you are assisting the person when they don't really need assistance. Again, allowing them to be independent a little bit longer. Just having that on their back dries their back. So again, it keeps them independent. And even if you are providing assistance, again, it speeds up things. Minutes here add up. Raising the toilet. 
Toileting is the next issue that persons said they need help with. First, investing in a taller toilet, 19 inches tall, or you it might be called an ADA toilet. Um, it's taller. Again, it helps for the person getting up independently on their own. That two inches is uh, pretty significant. Um, that extra two inches, that taller toilet, the person may be able to get up and down on their own independently a little bit longer. Or the lower picture actually shows a variation of this where a regular toilet is raised up with an insert. That's another way to do it. So when it's no longer needed, that can be removed and you have your standard toilet back if you haven't already fallen in love with the tall toilet. Um, almost everyone that we help do this um, says, oh, wow, I wish I'd had this before. Um, unless you're a short person, I'll qualify that. But here's other ways of doing it if you don't have the funds or are not interested in getting a new uh, toilet. There are, again, assistive technology devices that can make it so it is taller and easy or has built-in handrails also. This is the shower chair I was talking about earlier. And this is one, they have all kinds of metal ones. This is one that's made out of plexiglass. It's very lightweight, it has wheels. So the person can sit down outside of the bathroom, they can sit down in the bathroom, and then they can be rolled into a rolled-in shower, or, as you can see, it's cut out. The seat is cut out, so they can be rolled actually right over the toilet. And that is easier than using a commode, that you have to worry about that bucket and cleaning it and dumping it all the time and this type of thing, of getting them so they can get to the toilet actually is a time saver and an energy saver. And then grab bars, keeping somebody independent. You can put them where you need them, not just where you see them in an ADA bathroom, but where that person actually needs them to either be independent again, they, so they go to the bathroom by themselves safely, or with assistance can help you do it, the caregiver do it, so that they can get up and down safely for longer because as long as you can get them to the toilet, that is easier than dealing with a commode. Next issue on that list was eating or feeding. So again, we're going to save time by get, keeping the person independent as long as possible, um, speed up some of the chores, or decrease the number of chores by some um, assistive technology to help with eating or feeding the person. First of all, um, it can be just stabilizing. If they are weak in managing and that plate or bowl is moving away from them, and that can be just rubber made um, placemats that are cut to fit under glasses or bowls or just using as a placemat or a shelf liner that you can cut down and use for whatever shape you want. There are assistive technology that um, can build up a plate or you can buy specific plates that the food, um, there's like a bumper and so the spoon or the fork can get to the bumper and the food is going to fall onto it and, and they can remain a little bit more independent. Again, feeding or eating. On the right side, this shows a fork that is bent at a right angle. And if you think about it, or just try it yourself, if you think about how, if you're eating soup or cereal, how much you use your wrist, but if the person does not have a, a limber wrist because of arthritis or a stroke or whatever reason, this allows just a movement up and down. Again, it saves time because you're not having to feed them. And second all, it's one less chore, okay. On the other side, someone who might have uh, a shaking of their hand which makes it very hard for them to eat, let's say Parkinson's for example, um, there are weighted forks, so the top spoon actually is very heavy, and that weight makes the body stop shaking for Parkinson's. When the brain is engaged in the chore, the, the shaking diminishes or goes away. On the bottom is a relatively new one, and we actually have, I got one and played with it for a while. It's called Liftware, is the, the brand name, Liftware Spoon. And in that little end of it, in that little square, is a very powerful little computer that actually is evaluating and counteracting the shaking. And so the end of the spoon that is actually the person is trying to eat with is very, is not moving is very stable or is considerably less than with the shaking. Again, it allows the person to eat them, feed themselves. You don't have to feed them. That's one less chore. That saves you time. You can be doing something else or actually eating your meal while it's hot. Mm -hmm. And these are just some little very low-tech ideas that 
Um, sometimes I, I don't even talk about because you figure people know about them, but maybe they don't. So using the tab on a can of um, protein drink or pop or water, whatever it is they're drinking, and it secures the straw. So it makes it much easier for a person to manage their own drink. A weak grip can be counteracted on a glass by just using rubber bands. That, that just holds it enough. There's enough resistance there so they can use their own hand and feed themselves. And water, whether they're in a chair or in a bed, possibilities of stabilized drinking system so they can get their own drink. Again, the little bell doesn't ring just because they need a sip of water. Saves you time, saves you energy. Um, how many of you are familiar with a camel pack or a hydration system? So these are bags of water that then on the drinking end of it, a person just has to um, bite it a little bit and suck. And basically the big long straw from the bag, they can drink it. Well, these types of systems, there are now um, components you can buy with them that they can be attached to a bed or a chair. So a considerable amount of water is available for the person to get the water themselves. Drink when they're thirsty and keep much better hydrated because they're not going to want to bother you so that people get dehydrated. So they can drink their own water, and this is of course shown on a hospital bed, but it could be any bed, um, or in the back of wheelchairs also. Again, keeping a person um, independent, uh, this, the cutout on the blue cup in the picture um, goes over the nose and it means for someone who has a stiff neck, they're able to drink. You could use a straw or this type of system and again stays independent. But one of the um, things I really want to emphasize is that independent drinking, many of us are aware of um, a, a cup similar to this one, but when you look at a cup and you're, you're thinking about getting it, um, two large handles so they're easy to hold on to is important, a stable base so keep it big at the bottom, um, clear is very good because the person can see where the fluid is to be able to drink themselves and know actually when they're going to get something in their mouth. And then the sip spout. While they can be for water and juices, you can actually get cups like this that have much larger holes that allow the person to drink soup, um, can drink very runny cream of wheat or oatmeal, and these types of things. This, was at, this is at the um, National Historic Museum in Washington, D.C. It was actually a display of all the coffee cup lids and how different they are. And even looking at those, you can see some are bigger and some are smaller. So we just have to find out who has the bigger ones and go get coffee there and then reuse it. No, because um, some of these are not even available anymore. But realizing that engineers are thinking about these types of things. So there are cups that you can get that allow much larger or thicker so you can do soup and things like that or blenderized food again that doesn't have to be fed but they can drink themselves so these are again two systems that can use a very thick and have very big holes for the speed of the chore or the number of the chores this could be for the person or the caregiver is thinking about doing things in a different way so are scissors assistive technology well normally not but if you're using them in a, in a different way they could be considered assistive technology so using scissors to cut things instead of cutting pieces of meat to eat little by little bite by bite with a knife and fork you can cut a lot of meat or a lot of spaghetti or a lot of pizza with a scissor much faster and this is an example, again, of using technology in a different way. Um, as a parent, I did this with my toddlers. Put it in a bowl, shoot, shoot, chop up that, that spaghetti, and it's in small parts like this, versus trying to do it with a knife, or cutting meat and, and food preparation with the raw meat down there, but using scissors to cut instead of knife and fork. Again, I know it's seconds and minutes, but it's a chance for you to, again, maybe have a hot meal. Number of chores. Okay, um, now we are talking about clothing protectors. We're not using that other word, which I know is all rolling around in your mind. Your mind starts with a B and has an IBS at the end of it. We're not using that word, okay? Um, this is an adult version. It's a clothing protector. You can buy really nice looking ones online, you know, if they were golfers or in the Navy or whatever. You can make your own. Do it yourself with either a plastic size that you can get at fabric stores or um, tablecloth and make your own. 
Um, here again, some ones you can buy and or make yourself or you're using old clothing. So it's very respectful. Now, how does this save time, Jane? Well, it saves time because if their clothing is getting dirty while they're eating, instead of taking the time to get their arms out of the shirt and everything else, you just take off the clothing protector. Notice I didn't use that word. You thought I was, weren't you? Um, so much easier, much quicker. And then you're washing that, not the whole shirt and the pants that got dirty. So less chores or smaller amount of chores. And the, in the example below is a clothing protector that actually looks very fashionable like the scarves. And it's not embarrassing. Um, so, you know, thinking about using it, and you could use it your own existing clothing um, or the person's clothing to, to create these. Again, if you're um, on the computer and go to do it yourself, DIY clothing protector, or that word. Um, you're going to find these and how to do it if you have, if you sew, have a sewing machine, your grandchildren do or friends do. Again, how can I help when they ask you? That's not assistive technology, but it's a caregiver when have ideas. And if you know somebody has a sewing machine and sews, wow, you could make me some of these. Here's the shirts I've had in the bag waiting for you to come. <laughs> so again, it can be do it yourself, but again, it's going to save time and energy. Oops, sorry, wrong way. Really the wrong way. Um, getting dressed. All right, first thing, no more t-shirts. Okay, and if you, the picture here is of a orangutan trying to put on a t-shirt, and it doesn't get that, doesn't it get that hard sometimes when you're trying to get the head and the arms and they don't want to raise their arms and it's harder. No more t-shirts. Okay, there are dressing aids, very simple. You can buy pre-purchased, nice looking clothes like this now from many places online um, and catalogs of, of uh, many of the stores that you may be familiar with have them too. But you can also adapt their own clothing, so Velcro. So they're having Velcro um, to put their own clothes on with buttons when that gets hard, using Velcro instead of zippers on pants to make it easier, um, dressing aids, um, adapting their shoes or getting new shoes so you don't have to tie them, sock aids to get socks on, getting shoes off and on. These are readily available things now. But also, again, you can purchase clothing like this or you can adapt their own clothing pretty darn easy this way. And again, instead of buttoning up the front and trying to get their arms on like this, all a person has to do to put on back buttoned or snapped or velcroed is put their arms forward. Much easier for a care provider. Um, saves frustration, stress, and time because you can do it just so much quicker and easier. Here's an example again of a back closure dress. Um, it, this works really well for a person in a wheelchair and this saves time getting dressed first of all and also for helping when they toilet. If you can see in the little graphic below that it's cut out behind. So when you're standing the person up and moving them to the toilet, you as the care provider aren't having to figure out how to get this dress out of the way and this type of deal. Much quicker and easier. And again, they can come in really nice. They can adapt old clothing that way or you can get nice looking things. For going out, thinking about dressing aids, um, if, they, if you're uh, transporting people and they are using a wheelchair, instead of all that stress, getting into that winter coat that's so hard, it's just using a poncho. And again, those are readily available and they're easy to make just with blankets and things like that. And the old mitten dilemma. Again, bringing this up from children to adults to persons who need care is that instead of worrying about thumbs or fingers getting into the right thing, is just one big circle. They can be easily made from blankets. You can purchase them. But again, much easier and quicker getting them when they need to go somewhere to the church or family or to doctor's appointments. Instead of all that time getting those fingers in the right little hole. This is not what a large concern on the research, but I do know as a care provider myself and someone who helped many others as a visiting nurse, getting the meds. It does save time to set up the meds one time a week. Talk to any time management people and they will tell you that. So either you setting them up, asking somebody else to set them up for you. Again, you can ask for help. Or many pharmacies do this now. 
that they'll take the meds and set them up for you and then have a system of, of all the pills ready to go at the right time. There are also medicine minders to help you remember or the person. Again, well, I can't leave because, you know, at noon they got to take the meds and I'm not afraid they will. There's all kinds of systems that they set up the meds and you can set a timer that reminds the person to take them, allows them not to take them when they shouldn't be taking them. And the very large system on the lower part is actually a large system that can be set up for a week or up to a month. And it reminds the person. So it can send a little bit of alarm or can actually say, Jane, time to take your medicines. And a drawer goes out and provides that medicine. If I don't take that medicine, by a certain length of time, the drawer goes back in after maybe several reminders. And I, my care provider, who comes once a day or maybe once a week, will know, whoa, Jane's not taking her meds or seems to be missing the noon meds when we need to work on this. So again, you don't have to do everything yourself. Someone can assist you set up. Or here's an example, and it's actually again readily available at some of our places that sell medicines, is a talking one. So it reminds the person, you know, what, what is this I can't quite remember, or I'm worried about them taking their meds correctly. It actually talks out loud when you push the button. It says whatever you want it to say, something like, Bill, this is your blood pressure medicine. Only take one in the morning with your breakfast. So it keeps them oriented and keeps them. And again, this was not on the list, but I'm including it. And that is bed protectors. You can buy very nice bread, bed protectors from many places online or in local stores. And that's a whole mattress. But you still end up having to change all the sheets if there's an accident and change the whole bed. Well, taking a lesson from nursing, um, hospital nurses, they don't so much anymore, but we used to, actually have half sheets that we put under the main part of the body. So we only had to change that much of the bed, if need be, if it didn't soak all the way through. And you can use anything from a plastic um, tablecloth under a half a sheet, take a top sheet, fold it in half and just use that. Or in this case, this is an example of a sheet that is sewn onto um, uh, there's an absorbent fabric like terry cloth in the middle and then plastic underneath and then sewed on the side. And it's tucked in, it's not wrinkly, you can actually tighten it, it's very comfortable. But again, that absorbs everything if you can't afford buying chucks and the blue pads and things like that. This is a way, again, that you only have to change part of the bed if that's an issue. Now I know I haven't addressed everybody's issues or your own specific things and I'm going to open up to questions and answers here pretty soon. But if you have a question about, is there an easier way to do this? Or is there a device that would help me with this? Um, you can contact Iowa Compass, 1-800-779-2001, and they all help you. Or if you call Maggie at hospice and talk to someone at hospice, they may be able to help you, or they know how to contact me also, and they can get some ideas from me also. So I'm more than happy to do those types of things, because I've only hit on the majority by research, and I know you probably all have your own specific things. And I pulled in a few other ones from my own experiences of things that might help. So now, are there any questions? I have a question, Jane. I was wondering if there's a website or specific areas you can send us to for the clothing? Um, there is a company that if you search under Buck, B-U-C-K, and then just say disability clothing or something like that, or search under disability clothing. There are several of them. Buck is one of the really large ones that sells shoes, clothes, pants, and everything else. Or, again, I can send you some more of those. But again, um, it's really easy to search the web. Even for those of you who are leery to or ask somebody to help you, again, just ask for someone who likes to do that. Um, and pretty much just write in on the search what it is you want. So device to help eat or you know, device uh, bed protector. Um, and, and it's amazing you'll, you'll get right to these things. Aids to help with dressing, dressing aids. You know, flip it one way or the other, those types of things. They'll show you a lot of ideas for things to think about. Yes, she's going to give you a microphone. How important do you think it is that um, 
that care facilities have be be up to date on assistive technology. Um, for instance, I'm not involved in direct hands-on caregiving because my dad is in a facility. And I can see how all of these devices would be so helpful in his care, but it seems in the first instance to be a constantly changing field, you know, of, of products. And along with that, to be cost prohibitive to facilities. So um, what are your thoughts on, on that issue? Um, first, I'll admit I'm a little bit biased um, because I have very, not just because I deal with assistive technology, but I think independence is very important. And many of these devices are also safety. Um, a lot of these devices are really low cost. The balance for a facility is that they have people. I have people that can feed. I have people that can change. I have, you know, they, it's a service. And that can be whether they're in a facility or you're in your own home giving care. Is that it's a, it's a way of, uh, it's a decision making point of yes, there's a service or I can do this, the person can do this independently, safely, or with a little assistance, I can do it and then I can use my caregiving money, my service money, to do something that I really want more. An example could be that, um, well, yes, uh, a service could come in and help the person take their own bath. You know, that service is available. A person might decide, though, with the, this assistive technology, they can do it by themselves, or the wife, caregiver, husband, whoever it is, could do it and in fact may want to do it if other, relief, other things could be relieved because that's a very you know, intimate and hand touching thing. I want to continue touching and doing this service safely um, and use those funds to pay for something I don't want to do like break the leaves in the yard <laughs> or mow the yard. Um, uh, and I, I'm going to do a sidebar before I finish answering your question because we all laugh at that mowing and that. But actually, a research project was done where they talked to men and women that were now their own care providers in their own home, not necessarily sick or ill. And women, uh, off, uh, more frequently, actually very frequently, overestimated their abilities. I can change the storm windows, I can mow the yard, I can do everything. And the reverse was when the person was a man. Well, I need help cooking dinner. You know, I need help doing laundry. Well, actually, they, all they probably needed to do was be trained how to do that, right? Um, so, you know, that's part of listening to what people need and want, and, and helping weigh those things out. In a facility, I think um, I've never been in a facility that had so much help and staff that that staff didn't have already enough to do that if with some of these devices, the person could do it. And independence and pride, um, respect, I think is part of using assistive technology. That with some of these eating aids, they wouldn't need to be fed. Now when the time is right, yes, that's there and it needs to be done. But maybe with some of these aids that are pretty low cost. There also then becomes in the issue if the family brings them in, or friends, are they going to get lost and things like that? So they do have to be labeled and things like that. Or they're universally available and it doesn't matter whose cup with the big hole it is. It belongs to the nursing home or the facility and anybody who needs it gets it. It is not a traditional part of their training. That's the other part. And it's not a traditional part of nursing. It's not, a it not even a traditional part of occupational therapy. That new kids, and I do mean kids, coming up, um, they're learning more about it than long-term OTs or PTs. So, in keeping up on it, you're exactly right. But there are some pretty solid ones that don't need to be changed a whole lot. That they are, they're assistive technology devices that have been around for 20 years and I'm still talking about them so people find out about them. The eating aids, the dressing aids, and things like that, that would make it easier. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Jane.